there's something in your life that you didn't like what happened and you were mad about it for a really long time. We all have big things in our lives that happen and we all wonder why did it happen to me? And on today's episode, we are going to figure out why, maybe not why it happened to you, but what caused it to happen. Hey, I'm Esty Rappaport, your host of the Life Fix University podcast. And today we are going to understand karma, the cause and effect of something and how these actions, whether good or bad, actually happen to you. Today, we've got a really special guest who's been studying karma for 30 years. He's also a yoga therapist and a neuropath, an author, and an international speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Lynn, for being here. I'm excited to be speaking with you. You want to start by telling us something you did funny as a kid that people laugh about still today. Oh, funny as a kid. Well, I grew up on a little island off the coast of Maine. So I would guess one of the funniest things I ever did was put on a full wetsuit. You know what a wetsuit is? Yeah. And went out in a boat and I went onto a ledge and I was like raking moss, sea moss. And you and, and I'm a little girl, you know, and it was traditionally a boy's thing to do. And I come in in my little boat with all my sea moss and stuff. So I think it was quite funny for the town to see me like that. (laughs) Oh, God, what was it like? What sort of town was this? Um, It was an island off the coast of Maine. So you can imagine it was pretty rural back then. Um, But it was it's a beautiful little uh, fishing community. Yeah. And like people still live there now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. My father is there and um, I, all my relatives are there. And uh, yeah, it's 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 a beautiful little community in Maine. Oh, gosh. OK, so you want to tell us how you got involved in just doing what you're doing? Well, um, it all goes back to growing up on that little island where I grew up. And, you know, I tell people that before there was even the word organic used for food, we were eating organic because we didn't have the ability to get fresh fruits and vegetables. So we would get whatever was in season there, berries or whatever, and put them up and eat them. And, you know, in the winter time, so everything was kind of organic. We ate fish as it came in off the boat. So I didn't really understand what it felt what it was like to, you know, taste things that were not pure, clean. So that kind of got me on to, um, we did a lot of folk medicine back then because there wasn't a doctor on the, on the island. So there was always kind of some folk things going on, little tinctures and stuff, making up from herbs and things. And it was just part of my bringing. And I just can, I continued that on, got involved in the health and fitness field. And from there became a naturopathic doctor, an aromatherapist, an herbalist, and a published author. And that's, that's what happened. So you like came off the island, like, would you go, was it like normal for you to go to Maine on a normal day or not something that you did so very often? Like how well, much were you in this little tiny, like <laughs> secluded from the world type of thing? <laughs> well, let's put it this way. Portland is the biggest city in Maine. And at the time, Portland probably had about 40,000 people. So that was the biggest city. And the best way to get to Portland was to take a boat. So we used to take a boat from the island to get to the city. And it was it was a long journey. So yeah, it was a big deal. And then when I left the island, I moved into Portland and I went to the University of Maine. And so that was like moving to Mars. You know, (laughs) it was amazing. And um, and then what happened was years went by and I ended up taking my my daughter was 16 at the time. And I said, let's go to Los Angeles for a year. I want to see what it's all about. Now, understand, I'd never driven on a freeway in my life. I had no idea what I was doing. And we got on a plane and we landed in Los Angeles. And I ended up living in Los Angeles for almost 30 years. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Coming from this little tiny Island. town. I don't even know what to call it. Yeah. So Los Angeles is like quite a nice jump. I guess you really liked it. I did. I did. Well, I came to Los Angeles. And, you know, one of the things that I loved about Los Angeles is it's such a diverse city. And I, you know, imagine you live in this little fishing village where everybody's related to everybody. And then you pop yourself into this world 
where you're meeting people from all over the world, every culture. It was just, I couldn't get enough of it. It was just so exciting for me. Yeah, I love that too. And I went to school in England. Like I left school early at 16 and did 11th and 12th grade in England. And literally that was my favorite part too. Also meeting people from all over the world and learning all different cultures. And Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating. Okay. So how did you get involved in the actual karma part? I think it's like pretty much the thing that everybody's been talking about the past couple of years, but I'm curious to know how you like done it, your whole like business around it. Well, um, I'm also a yoga therapist, certified yoga therapist. And as a naturopath and a yoga therapist, um, we believe that when you work with an individual or your health is a matter of body, mind, and soul. So it's not just taking care of nutrition and exercise, that's a component, and your mental health, but also your soulful health is important. And so I found myself at a time when life was a little chaotic for me, and I stumbled across karma. I started studying karma, and this now we're going back 30 years ago. And as I began to study karma, I took about uh, six months of my life, and I didn't. All I did was study and meditate, and um, just really kind of live in some seclusion, pretty much seclusion. And then I um, started putting together karma workshops, and I wrote a book about karma, got it published, and I was doing workshops in um, Los Angeles, and they were a big hit. You know, I would have a real huge group of people that would come. So that's kind of how I got started on karma. And then I continued to teach it and use it throughout my practice. But I would say that most people don't know what karma is. Yeah, that's that was my key. question. What's your definition of karma? <laughs> <laughs> karma is simply cause and effect. And when we hear and people say, well, it's good karma, or it's bad karma, there is no good or bad karma. If you think about this, everything in life is simply, they affect everything that happens has a cause. And karma just says it's pure energy. There's no judgment. It's cause and effect. You do this, this happens. And then we have to sit and discern and look at it. But what happens, most people jump in and they judge. And karma is not about judge. It's about judging others. But it's about learning from all the things that happen in your life, how to better yourself, or as we say in karma, to make panja, to make good merits. And that's good deeds. Okay. So how does that actually play in life, right? Like if you, I want to become a better person based on karma what do I have to do? Well, things are going to going to happen in your life. So let's say you lose your job and you go, oh my God, this is bad karma happening to me. It's not bad karma. There's a reason why you have lost your job and there's an opportunity in there for you to take your life to a better direction. But what happens is most of us fall back into the victim mentality. Oh my God, bad karma. What did I do? I'm such a bad person. You're not a bad person. Maybe the job you were in wasn't a good fit for you. And maybe you're going in the wrong direction. And just by being tossed upside down and going back out, maybe you will find your passion or your inner direction in life. So everything that happens, happens for a reason. And, and it's how it's how we address that reason that makes a okay. difference. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Now, someone might, is it, is it right to say that I did something that caused me to have this karma, to cause me to lose my job? Now, it might be a good thing, but what was that thing that I did that caused me to lose a job? Mm -hmm. And that's where karma comes back and says, can you reflect upon that? Can you find that? So let's say you're a very um, obstinate person, and I know you're not, (laughs) but you're in the workplace and you just don't have any flexibility at all. You're rigid and you're, you know, and so you don't fit. It doesn't work within that work environment. So you have created that. You're the cause of that. And the effect is you get fired. Now. Are you, can you reflect upon that or do you continue to point at the boss and point at the workplace and find the fault there? Or can you reflect on what it is that perhaps maybe you need to work on? Because that is why you are here. According to karma, you are here to work on your own self 
and you use the world and the experiences in the world to help you get there. Yeah, I think that makes the that explains it really well. Um, you look at what caused the action to happen and then reflect back on yourself. How did that happen? Can you give us another example, maybe in marriage? Ah, uh, yes. Well, you know, karma says that sometimes here's a, an example. People come into this world and they find themselves in a tumultuous relationship, a bad relationship. And karma would say that perhaps in your past life, you didn't resolve those kinds of issues. And so you come back into this life and you find yourself in an unhealthy relationship, but there's a lesson to be learned in this. What can you learn from it? Because karma is simply about you are here to learn your lessons, to improve yourself through this life, because according to karma, you will come back, you keep coming back through lives until you evolve. And so it's an opportunity to learn. So so what specific thing could happen in a marriage? Let's say um, somebody got into a fight. They have to go and look at the action that caused them the fight that well, let, afterwards create the strain on the relationship. In karma, there are four great passions and everything comes from these four great passions and their deceit, greed, anger, and pride. So let's look at anger. Everybody knows what anger feels like. Everybody has been angry or had someone angry come at them. So when you are expressing anger, you're an angry person, right? That, because the anger is within, within you. So the idea with, with karma is to understand the passion and how destructive that passion can be. And what can you, how can you turn that passion around, especially when you're in a heated debate with your mate? You know, you're both really in an argument. But what is being, what is being, what is being accomplished by butting heads in this anger that you're each shooting at each other? You each become angry people. So it's the ability to step back and say, well, wait a minute, this is anger. Is there a better way to approach and communicate? then through anger. And of course there is. And that's how you work it through. Rather than if, if I'm in a relationship, my husband and I are fighting, if I'm pointing the finger at him and saying, you know, he's an angry man, I don't like him. He's, you know, I'm finding all fault with him. I'm not dealing with my own sense of anger, which is one of the great passions. And these four passions are the things that cause, that so-called cause everything? All all, all passions all come from these four, deceit, greed, anger, and pride. And if you look at the four of them, you can see where different emotions and passions come from those four great passions. According to karma, those are the four great that we are here. We have to master those four great passions in our lifetime. And you might say, well, that's pretty, okay, I can do that. That's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any tips on how to master these four passions? You know, I tell my students and, you know, because I tell everyone, I say, I've been at this for 30 years and I have not mastered it yet. I am humbled every day about how easily I can slip off that, that edge and find myself being angry at the person who cut me off. Consciously, I work every day at saying to myself, okay, let's say someone cuts me off in traffic and I get a little angry. I try to pull back and say, well, wait a minute, Lynn, you're the one with the anger. The person cut you off, you know, let it go. I don't want to carry that around with me because if I carry that anger with me, then I carry it to the store that I go to and I'm rude to someone and I bring it home and I start a fight, you know, and it's snowballing effect. And I personally don't want to be an angry person or to carry that because it disrupts my life. Yeah. So when you look at it, what's disrupting my life and what's making my life better? What would make it better would be to say to that person, it's okay, you cut me off, I'm fine. You know, you're in a big hurry, you know? Right, right. It's like that person is already in their car driving off like three miles ahead of you and you're the one still sitting there angry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and and it doesn't serve you. Right. So how has your view on karma changed from when you first learned about it 30 years ago and like now? Well, it was, you know, I was more studying the philosophy of it and trying to really understand it. 
now it's a part of my life and it's something that, I mean, I practice karma every single day of my life. Um, I teach karma every week, but I also practice it within myself. So it's a matter of when you first start, you're, you're like they call it the beginner's mind and you're trying to absorb all of this stuff and figure out how it works throughout your life. It takes experience and it takes using it to under, to to make it become part of your life. So I would say that it's the process of, you know, being angry, <laughs> having those feelings, and then having to bring myself back and understand where it was coming from. So there's a lot of self-awareness that goes on in here. Absolutely. That's why karma is all about, that's why you're here. According to karma, you chose to come here on earth and take on human qualities. And you chose the body, the mind, the parents, where you are, you chose that. And so since you chose that, and you chose this path of life, it is there for your evolution. And, you know, it's one of the worst things we do is a good example would be we all, and especially as females, we beat ourselves up. You know, my hair's not pretty enough. My legs, are, you know, we, we are very critical. But when you start to realize that you chose this body, this is a beautiful body. Everyone has a beautiful body, a beautiful being. They chose it. And it's for your evolution. You chose it for a reason. In a way, it makes it a lot harder because it's like, oh, no, I chose this. And like now I'm the one I you have to like actually take the responsibility for it. You can't blame anyone for saying. There you go. That's karma. That And when you start to do that, that's the cause, cause of the effect. You start to take responsibility. Then the effect becomes you become a nicer person. You become, you know, a kinder person. You look at the world with different eyes. You know, that's the effect because you're the cause is you are really reflecting and going inside and looking more at yourself and how you relate to the world rather than, you know, being the victim or, you know, um, and not really taking control of your own life. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, um, like concrete tips to give to someone who wants to start practicing karma? Because most people listening have not been practicing for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just written, I, I have an, a new series out. It's called the Soul Walking Series. And the first book in the Soul Walking Series is How to Master Your Karma. So, I, you know, of course, you know, a little plug for my book here. But the thing is, I've really worked, I've dedicated 30 years of my life. Um, I also have an online yoga class every Saturday where we practice yoga, uh, karma yoga. And the book comes from, really comes from a deep dedication to wanting to share that with other people, how really it's a very simple and very practical path to walk. It's not, you know, out there. It, it gives you really practical methods for being able to deal with your life on a very constructive way. So I would say that you have to start and try to find someone who understands karma, that you can read their books, take their classes, follow, and you will learn how to work your karma. Okay. Any suggestions for like right now till they get their hands in their books? <laughs> till they get their hands in their book. The first thing to you have to step back. Remember, everything is cause and effect. So if you get up, let's say you get up and you're not feeling so good this morning. What did you eat yesterday? What did you do yesterday? How did you take care of yourself yesterday? Because that's going to reflect in the next day. So that's kind of an immediate type thing. But, you know, we get up and we think, oh, I don't feel good. And da, da, da. But you don't stop and reflect. Well, oh, wow. You know, I drank too much. I ate too much. I did whatever we did, you know, which because everything that happens to you has a cause. And you have to look to the cause to either change or enhance the effect change or enhance what do you what do you mean by seeing enhance the effect well let's say the effect is um i i'm very kind to you and so therefore you do something really really nice for me we have a, we have a really nice exchange here okay now 
I can continue to be kind and enhance that, not just towards you, but towards other people and enhance that sense of kindness within myself. And what happens? I'm enhancing that. And then people, when they, when I leave a room, people say, oh, Dr. Lynn's such a kind person. Right. That's, that's, that's the trail I leave behind me. And that's what I take with me. When you depart this world, you take the good merits and you also take your misdeeds. And that's what karma teaches us, that whatever you know you, you do in this life, you have to take that with you. And then you get to come back and you get to change those things. So you want to take more good stuff than bad stuff. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> what if someone's like doing this reflection and for some reason the karma doesn't add up, right? Like you're being really nice to me and you really are being really nice to me. But for some reason, I'm not doing it back to you. That's you. That's on you. You know, that's that's it's up to me at that point to observe. And let's say I observe and I say, wow, you know, she's really a very angry person. I could see a lot of anger there. I'm not going to take that on. I don't have to, because if I take it on, I become an angry person. Now I'm in the great passion. Now we are in a, we are in a relationship that is not healthy. So it's to step back and have some compassion and understanding because maybe you're, uh, you're angry because you haven't really had the time to, or ability to reflect and to go within and, and to work on that. Or maybe, you know, it's a lot of things that are coming on in your life that I can't change. But I know what it feels like to be an angry, lonely, sad. I know all of those emotions because you can't escape them if you're a human being. You have to experience all of them. So I have compassion for you because you're in that place and understanding for you. And so I give you kindness, but I don't need to stay in your presence because perhaps maybe if it's very, if you're in the presence of someone who's very toxic, bless them and move on. That's, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Again, it's like taking responsibility for yourself. So you're understanding yourself, you're being aware of yourself and you are being understanding and awareness of others, like others awareness almost. And then you're taking responsibility by blessing them and moving on. Exactly. Because you can't change them, right? You, you cannot change a person. You can only do this within yourself and you have to decide who and what do you want to be? How do you want to walk on this earth? Do you want to walk as an angry, deceitful, greedy, prideful person? Or do you want to do the opposite of those? And that takes work. And Lifetime that's work. <laughs> karma. Karma means work. It means you're here to work, not to play. But the thing about karma is once you learn how to tip that and to work your karma, life becomes so much easier. You know, things open up to you because what do you, what do you, what are you drawn to? You're drawn to people that are kind. You're drawn to people that are happy. You're drawn to people that have that energy. You know, and so you get drawn to that energy and then it becomes part of your energy. Yeah, and you don't have to waste all that energy on like being angry at a person, right? Like going back to that person that cut you off, who's already way ahead of you, and you're like not even focusing on your driving and just mad and get to the store mad and you come home all just like tired and finished and done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So life karma is really just lifetime work of reflection mm -hmm. on yourself and seeing what has caused the action that has happened. Yeah. And, and it's continual work, you know, it's like, that's karma, you know, it's just keep working and keep paying attention, be aware of, and that's why I bring to my students, like the four great passions. Those are very important to be aware of, you know, um, there's also the troublesome four and the troublesome four, which are also things that we have to work on, which are envy, jealousy, resentment, and revenge. Now, who has What's a the difference between the two of them? Between what? Envy and Trouble jealousy? Troublesome four and the four great passions. The four great passions, those are the passions. The troublesome four are things that come in. Like if you think about envy, envy is really a byproduct of greed. Can, okay. You know? Right. Um, yeah. So it's a byproduct of the four great passions. But 
right connected to those four great passions are what are called the troublesome four. And those come in and get inside your mind and they eat away at you. If you think about, let's take revenge, for example. I can't tell you the people I know that have destroyed their life over they're going to get even with the guy or the girl that dumped them. And and their whole focus is that. And they destroy their life because of that, you know, because they want to get even. They want to revenge. The best revenge of all is to be successful in your own right, you know, to be happy. That's the best. But people get caught up in the emotions. And that's the problem. It's both the wonderful thing about being a human being is when you decide and you come here and you're a human being, every human being has to experience every feeling and every experience there is to be a human being, because that's what it's about. We have to experience all of those things, but it's what you do with those that counts. It's the work that you do to balance everything out. Yeah. So if one's a byproduct of the other, then how do you know which one to work on first, or you're just working on the whole situation of you as a person? You're working on the whole situation of you, but again, it all goes back to awareness. <clears throat> okay. Before we even started this interview, you were not aware of the four great passions. Correct. Okay. Now you're aware of the four great passions. And if those go into your consciousness and they start to really sit in here, you're going to carry those with you and you're going to see them pop up throughout your day. You're going to go, oh my God, there's greed. And you're going to see it for what it is. Or you will even experience it within yourself because we're all greedy. We all act out in ways. And it's the ability to retract back and go, oh, wow, that's one of the four great passions. I need to master that because I want to master my karma. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. And I always say everything always starts um, with self-awareness. And I think you've honestly explained it really well um, and proving it why really we need that self-awareness to be able to go and change any cause. So that way we have a different effect so that our cycle continues in the way that we want it to continue. Absolutely. Because we are all, we're all just energy. We're energy vibrating at different levels. So you're, you're here and everything is about energy and moving energy throughout the universe. So if you're creating this energy stream of kindness and, and generosity, you know, and those things and humility, the things you are overcoming those four great passions, that energy starts building and it multiplies and it multiplies. And that's what you want to do is, is make that more, those passions come up more and the four great passions you know, dissipate. So is there also like so-called certain passions, specific ones that we want to make more or just in general, the good energy? Well, karma teaches the, the yamas and the niyamas. And those are, they're kind of the pathways of ways that you should try to live your life. And what that means is we try to develop virtues so we are here to remove our vices and vices are all come from the four great passions and we are and we're to replace those with the virtues so for example greed you replace it with generosity so we you it's working to replace those things with things that make you virtuous because according to karma and believe me I've been studying this for over 30 years and I'm a long ways from not coming back again. But at some point, if you evolve to such a level, let's say the Buddha, you know, you don't need to come back to earth and go through all of this again, but you have to keep karma. That's what it means. Reincarnation and the recycle is you keep coming back and back again, because it's like you're washing yourself each time you come back to get cleaner and cleaner. And that that's that's the the evolution of the soul. Okay, so we're replacing greed with generosity. What about the other three? Well, if you are deceitful, that's lying. So you have to learn to that we could replace that with honesty. And it it, it might be pretty simple to say, well, honest, I can be honest, but we deceive ourselves. 
You know, we we do things that are deceitful all the time. Every single one of us, little tiny deceitful things. So it takes a lot of work to be able to say, oh, wow, that was a little deceitful. I think I'm going to try to practice a little honesty here. And sometimes it's very hard to be honest with other people. You know, you have to make sure that you do no harm. You don't want to hurt anyone. So if honesty true, brutal honesty is going to hurt someone, you kind of have to work with that a little bit. You know, that's where your virtues come in. But then, you know, you've got deceit and then greed, absolutely generosity. And that's really not to, well, it, it can be difficult in today's world. You know, I mean, everybody has that little element of greed in there. Everybody wants to be noticed, be, you know, um, but generosity is would counteract that. Anger, of course, is kindness, compassion, and pride is humility. And that's a big one because sometimes it's very difficult to humble yourself in life and to step back. And it's like, as I tell my students, I don't have all the answers. None of us do, you know, and I, I have, and I said to you earlier, I'm humbled every day by how easily I can fall off that fine edge and be deceitful, greedy, angry, or have pride, you know, even to a small degree, it happens. Yeah, yeah, it's literally a life's work of, a life's work. Just well, you're, you're constantly, you're, you're interacting with other people and with the world, and not everybody is evolved in certain levels, you know, and so you're going to encounter people that are going to test that constantly in you. Every single day, someone tests my ability to be kind and compassionate. And so, but I see it when they do it. I go, wow, this is a great opportunity. It's, I don't buy into it. I step back and, 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 you know, I can't tell you how many times I have countered that with kindness and had the person just in a state of shock. You know, <laughs> just for that, it's worth it just for the reaction. <laughs> and then you go, wow, I just worked my karma and the person, you know, and and what have you done? You've, you you feel so good. You haven't gotten caught up in it. And sometimes you can really help the other person. And that's really why we're here, too. You know, your journey is also about, you know, making yourself and making the world a better place. Totally. Totally. Yes. Okay. So before we get to our final question, where could we connect with you and learn more about you? Well, you can go to um, drlynn.com. It's D-O-C-T-O-R-L-Y-N-N.com. That's my website. And you'll find the Soul Walking series, all the books and my online classes there. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of those. Pretty much, I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram, so that's a really good place. And I post things on a regular basis there. Um, I'll post things from the Karma book, or we are now um, working on the next book, and I'm teaching, which is called How to Master Prosperity with a Purpose. And that takes karma to the next level. It's a much deeper level that we work on karma. So there's karma, and that one goes to a much deeper level. So that we're working on right now. And I post things on a daily basis that might be little parts of it. So, Ooh, okay. So everyone, the links are going to all be in the show notes. So you can go and follow her and learn wonderful, wonderful. about it. Now, final question. How would you describe an extraordinary relationship without using love, trust, and for you, I'm putting in karma. <laughs> <laughs> How would I, an extraordinary relationship, well, I would say that I would go back and I would say what my mother told me many, 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 many years ago. My mother told me, and I'm going to have to, can I use the word love, but it's not part of it? Okay. Okay. She said, you know that you really love someone and someone really loves you when you go through the hard times. It's not the good times, the good times, the trips and the jewelry and the dinners and all of that stuff is easy. But it's when you go through really tough and difficult times in your life and you hang in there with that person, then you have what is what is called a solid relationship. 
And that solid relationship transcends everything that we think we know about love and romance and all of that stuff. And that is really the gist, because in today's society, it's very easy to leave a relationship for nothing. You know, we're very transient and we, we, we divorce, we leave, we break up. It's another thing to stay there and work it through. And that is, I can't say the K word, <laughs> but we're, I could say cause and effect. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so if you want the effect to be a good, really solid relationship, how do you get there? Look to the cause. What can you do to make that that solid relationship? I love that. I love that so much. What can you do to make that awesome? It's like starting with like thinking of your end goal and then working towards that backwards in every mm-hmm. aspect of your life. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lynn. This was really interesting, really informative, and a really good start to learning more about karma. I appreciate mm-hmm. you being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. And again, you know, um, I know you're going to send me the link to this and I will make sure that I get that out to everybody. And uh, I hope we'll have an opportunity to speak again because it was great fun. Yes, it was. Thank you. That's all for this episode of the Life Fix University podcast. But I have a huge favor to ask of you that will not only support the show, but will also help the people you love most. We are striving for 1 million downloads by the end of 2025, and we can't do this without your help. If you love this episode, please share it with two of your family and friends so they too can rewire their brains to have an extraordinary marriage. It was awesome spending time with you, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye.